Knuckles the Echidna is black-coated. Look, I know these editorials are supposed to start off with something insightful, knowledgeable, funny, anecdotal, or whatever $30 haircut word you can think of, but how many YouTubers are gonna hit you with a level one super at the round start? If you don't get that, don't worry. It was a fighting game joke and it was mad funny. Digression aside, Knuckles being black seems to be the basis for Ken Pender's magnum opus at least the one that you can read. Knuckles the Echidna. Over the course of almost four years, Ken and his team were able to dive into the obscure understanding of Knuckles. His past, abilities, family, motivations, everything. This was big since at the time, the last game we saw Knuckles in was Knuckles Chaotix. If he was in Sonic 3D Blast, sure, but let's be real, no one really remembers Sonic 3D Blast. But Dick, aren't you gonna talk more about Ken? Not really. I've seen people actually get interviews with him, and there's no way I'm putting anything more than a tweet into the wild to grab his attention. Why cover Ken when other people already have and still are doing it today? Plus, I care more about his works than who he is as a person. Well, is this an in-depth story breakdown of the books? Chief, I've read this. Live. On stream. With six other people which you can find on YouTube here. If that ain't good enough for you, I can't be expected to chew your food for you. But I will cover some of the dumber points of the arc and what the themes are. And who knows, maybe we can get some views from those who read it with me. No, unacceptable. Now, with all that out of the way, let's get into it. A strong start for a new series, on paper. Ken wastes no time going into the history of the Echidna people in a way that I'll generously refer to as parallelism. Usually the page will have panels filtered to denote this, so if you don't care about bullshit flashbacks, you know what to skip. Knuckles is being hunted by the Dark Legion as they come out of the- Shut the fuck up, how is it called the Twilight Zone? How is that even allowed? Imagine if you will, a world where 9 plus 10 does not in fact equal 19. He and the Chaotix are captured. Knuckles is interrogated about the Chaos Chamber, something that will be explained much later on. Busts out of captivity and puts on a disguise to help his friends. I forgot to mention, Knuckles' absentee father is also watching over him from some fucking worldwide surveillance system? Using this to have Archimedes the Fire Ant help out Knuckles wherever possible. In the final issue of the arc, a fire gets started by the Dark Legion for some reason? I mean, they're in the forest too, so this was a shit plan. And it causes a stampede, so the furries are just- okay. After putting out the fire and saving the stampede of people that just so happen to be in the area, Wait, if Vector's beats put out the fire, does that mean he listens to trash? The Chaotic steal more disguises and a flying saucer and head to a race rally? Would you believe me if I told you Ken is still being subtle here? Which I guess the Dark Legion were just planning on immediately having after fucking up Knuckles. By the way, I'm saving you from the flashbacks every two to three pages that just have the most dialogue. The Chaotix crash the rally, beat up the proudly robed boys, and fuck off up escape hatches. Oh, the Dark Legion have an underground base and escape hatches, and the rally was going on there, which is supposed to imply that they've been here for ages from the flashbacks, but whatever. Alright, this one, Vector gets fucking worked by a Dark Legionnaire. Which I'm making sound way cooler for what is just a Sonic character in a black hood with a red face beating up the Crocodile Dentist game. Knuckles is meditating with Archie and the same Legionnaire walks up on him. They fight for a page and Knuckles reveals, Gasp! You am female! 
The Legionnaire starts telling them. I, I wrote a blog post a while ago about why I f***ing hate video games. Because this is what it does. It appeals to like the male fantasy. Until Knuckles goes, not all men. Ken also has our female antagonist admit that she doesn't know why she had to do this risky thing alone. By the way, this is Julie Sue, who introduced herself very naturally earlier. She and Knuckles just walk around Marble Garden Zone until they bump into Echidnopolis. Literally. It's explained that the Hyper Zone Projector, a thing that is essentially keeping the city wakanda is fucking up. But before Knuckles can do anything about it, he's arrested. Middle issue. Before Knuckles is interrogated, dingoes seem to be teleporting or merging into their realm. I don't know, it's kind of hard to make sense of. We're introduced to General Stryker and his particularly interesting tattoo. Before cutting back to Knuckles' meeting, I'm trying to remember if it's his grandfather, but I'm just gonna say ancestor and move on because there's a lot of these fucking guys. His ancestor has all of these home movies of past echidna history just ready to be narrated over for pages at a time. Ken really plays up how amazing the echidna guardians are, like they're just fucking superheroes, and where the hat from the OVA comes from. Third issue. The dingoes are just in the echidna town and start taking prisoners. Knuckles breaks the prisoners out and makes plans to liberate the rest of the city. To do this, they look for the leader who's just in City Hall. Knuckles doesn't chuckle and whips Stryker's ass even though he has his amazing power glove. I love the power glove. It's so bad. Knuckles doesn't finish him off because the dimensional merge is happening. I guess Chris Chan was right. It kind of just finishes. Knuckles and the group are fine. Yippee. Then Knuckles puts on the hat from the OVA for some reason. Oh my god. Future dick here. I thought I was done recording lines for today, but I want to read this comment verbatim. Not sure 90s comic book storytelling is for you. This shit is 90s comic book goodness. So many references to Krypton and the lost city of Kandor with these echidnas. DC Zero Hour themes abound with this story particular. My suspicion with people like you is you are about 20 years old and didn't grow up reading comics of the era to fully apricate what is being done here. Not every issue has been a banger, but since we broke out of the initial mini, this book started really slapping. Think about it. This was supposed to be a three issue mini and it ended up going 32 issues or some shit because it was good. I agree the first three was a slow burn. We told a lot of backstory. Open parentheses kinda reminds me of Breath of the Wild close parentheses. But this is popping now. You cray at this point, or maybe just a pender hater, IDK lol. <laughs> he had to edit it. <laughs> it was worse, dog. So the ultimate echidna warrior gets called from space to pillar man out of a statue of himself. He immediately cuts a promo at the Dark Legion rally, and we cut to Knuckles and Julie Sue who starts complaining about her Republican choices, which means she can't see her family anymore. Side stories. Dingoes are mad about housing conditions and the echidnas go, damn, that must suck. Knuckles' mom regrets that her son is part of whatever this storyline is. Locke, Knuckles' dad, watching his dad die of a heart attack. He mentally projects into his dad's mind and gets cussed out for it. Back to Knuckles. He and Julie Sue climb a mountain, but we cut after one page to see Ultimate Warrior in his sexnasium. Remember, all of these storylines are happening at the same time. Ken says every one of these are important for the setup. Knuckles expects the house on the mountain, leaves, and gets ambushed by Ultimate Warrior, who's 40 feet tall from his warrior spirit. Next issue, the Astral Realm. Knuckles gets scolded by Ultimate Warrior. They throw hands, and Warrior just teleports him underwater. 
I actually really like this transition from underwater to a water cooler in the Dark Legion's camp, so I'm gonna just keep the flow that the comic actually has. This transitions to Julie Sue covering how she was totally double-crossing Knuckles and goes back to the camp. The Chaotix are apparently here in the Dark Legion camp too, ready to be executed in a strangely ancient style and they put the fire ants in a cooler and they bury it while also knuckles's mom's laura lay goes to the cops to talk about how the neighborhood has gone downhill ever since those dingoes in our third parallel we cut back to Locke waking up next to his dad who's still in a coma but he wakes up to deal with the alarms going off Triggered by Julie Sue joining the Legion again, I guess. Nothing else relevant to this side story happens in this issue. Back to Knuckles. While underwater, he fights a Kraken while getting shit talked by the warrior, gets out of the Kraken grip, and surfaces. Finally, Warrior puts Nux into the lower atmosphere and dunks his ass back to Earth. Before Knuckles gets spiked into the rocks, Warrior freezes him midair and just decides to start disassembling him on a molecular level as a flex, I guess? Third issue. Oh man. Ultimate Warrior teleports in to cut a promo and make a golden bridge to Echidnopolis. The Legion heads into the city while leaving the Chaotix pinned to die in the desert. Again, an actual ancient execution method. Knuckles comes back to form by his great-grandfather and he teleports him to the Chaotix and the Fire Ants in the desert. Meanwhile, the dingoes are being conscripted to help the Echidna police for reasons of, I guess they didn't train an actual Echidna military? Which is kind of fucked up to use your enemy's military to fight a third party. During the assault, Ultimate Warrior runs out of steroids and Bold Shark Testosterone claims another Echidna life. In the final pages, Sonic just fucking shows up and gets zapped by the please buy the Sonic the Hedgehog comic tie-in to make any sense of this issue villain, otherwise known as Mammoth Mogul. Ken Deadass had to get one-upped by another villain to tie back into the Sonic comic, and if you don't buy those specific issues of Sonic and read them as we didn't, you will have literally no idea what happened. And the next issue just starts with that entire conflict resolved and new bullshit instead. All right, we gotta speed this up. So, for this arc, Ken decides to crack open the old Bibble and flip back to the Old Testament. But not like the wild parts, just the ones everyone knows. Apparently there is a lost tribe of Echidna who fled their former homes and became known as the Lost Tribe. Yes, they are literally a tribe fleeing the big city. Very good, Ken, you made the Echidnas equivalent to the, you know. Turns out Knuckles is destined to lead them to what is essentially Zion, Albion, Peter Molyneux. Issue 11. The Lost Tribe is traveling along the California fault line because Knuckles has to save them from countless earthquakes and disasters. It's apparently a test of faith? What faith? Shut up. Don't worry about it. Ken can't do better than the Bibble and neither can we. At the end, the tribe gets captured, Sonic and Tails get a sexual awakening, and Knuckles is going to get shot in the head by... Sonic? Okay, so, issue 12, we learn that that wasn't Sonic. It's like a relative or something named Rob O. The Hedge. Very clever. He saves them from the medieval sci-fi Robin Hood town analogy through a wacky and cool fight sequence, and at the very end, Knuckles literally walks across water to reach Albion. And I just have to pause here for this fucking panel. He gets told that his dick is canonically massive, gets the MacGuffin Stone to prove it, and then just leaves? Like, just into rocks as they glow, with no explanation. I guess the MacGuffin Stone gives him wormholes or something? Genuinely surprised he didn't part the sea, honestly. Homie, we gotta pick up this pace. Uh, you get how this goes by now.
All right, you guys know about drugs, right? Well, Ken does too. Turns out they're bad for you. In issue 13, we learn that Lemon Sundrop Dandelion is on the rise, and it gets Charmy's best friend, Mello. Yeah, he literally overdoses on a spiked chili dog and dies. It's actually on the cover. The little guy goes through genuine grief and depression over the death of his friend, and by that I mean we brush over it this issue. So the gang goes to the source, which is run by Mickey Mouse inside Disneyland, I guess, and unknowingly ends up getting high on the supply. Except for Julie, because she hates the boys. Issue 14. Charmy is a prince, and he ran away from home. Don't ask me, dude. Uh, Ken just does things, mostly in contrived flashbacks. We learn that Mickey is just a dealer and not the supplier. In reality, the supplier is some mob boss bunny with a stand for a bodyguard. <laughs> Wait, his name is Downtown Ebony Hair? <laughs> well, um, I think I'm looking forward to crack. We get reintroduced to Stryker and a dingo cab driver named Harry. More on them later. Julie gets the police involved in the drug bust while the gang is almost ODing in a hospital. And she gets thrown off a goddamn building by Black Bugs Bunny. Issue 15. Julie is fine after getting a grapple from Boot Space. Turns out the dingoes are involved, but Ken is subtle with species representation. And the chaotic sober up to join the shit show. They get a cab and it's driven by guess who? And Harry pulls out a literal gun on the boys at first, too. Back at the drug bust, drug bugs and some mad scientist want to pull an MK Ultra. Very good, Ken. And get the entire island either high or dead. The entire gang gets involved trying to stop him, and he whips out the big iron on his hip. Bugs whiffs every shot, and the entire drug ring gets arrested. Yippee! Remember, kids, when it comes to drugs, that's no good. Charmy's friend is still dead, by the way. See him get buried at the end, funeral and everything. Charmy's entire family and a number of characters mourn over Mello's grave. Charmy gets called back home to rule over the kingdom and leaves the chaotix. And we really don't see Charmy again for the rest of the comic. Wait, does that make Charmy a queen bee? I didn't mention it earlier, but there are some constant cut-ins of Knuckles beating the shit out of random people in some wasteland. And then his relatives just pop off and go about it like, Oh man, he's getting so strong! A byproduct of this arc having the least involvement from Knuckles actually made it one of the best. But it's still murder on the pacing. Lara Lay is getting some Jimmy in her at church. And by that I mean religion. Which is perfect timing, cause this is the Knuckles talks to his parents and asks why they're divorced issue. While this happens, the men are doing manly things like sitting at a table and talking about the most boring shit ever. Knuckles learns that his mom is getting remarried, so Knuckles runs away from her like a little bitch. Julie Sue tries to comfort him and take advantage of his emotionally compromised situation by smacking him on the cheek with her lip. It's heavily implied that they're both just too young to be honest with their feelings, but they both obviously want to just fuck on the dock. Number 17. Julie Sue almost kills a man with her horse. Kills an echidna. I, I don't care anymore. This guy somehow knows that she's a dark legionnaire and tries to kill her, and we interrupt attempted murder to have Knuckles explain how the MacGuffin Stone works. It will not be relevant in the future. We cut forward sometime in the future to Knuckles, Julie Sue, and the mystery man having a lovely brunch on a deck. The ring on Knuckles' neck is <laughs> literally plot important, as it signifies he's a guardian, which is the dumbest thing Ken could have thought of after immediately reading JoJo's that evening. We end the issue with Knuckles visiting the original leader of the Dark Legion in police lockup. Issue 18. Knuckles perform what can only be called prisoner torture by beating a man in a cell for information. Our hero, according to Ken. Meanwhile, Tobor, uh, that's this ancestor's name, by the way, is just visiting Lara Lay to have tea and vent on her couch. During the beating, Nux and the Legionnaire leader get teleported to the negative zone for some classic Superman bullshit. They fight, and the prisoner, Kragok, by the way, seems to get away. In a rare occurrence for Ken, he actually has two plot lines intersect. 
Tobor just opens a window, jumps out, and smacks Kragok as he comes out of a convenient portal nearby. This lets Knuckles escape and puts Tobor back in the negative zone with Kragok. There's also some plot setup that there's a mole in the Water Buffalo Lodge that Knuckles' dad is in. Uh, sure. This arc is really just set up as this is where Ken was getting more freedom to be more standalone since sales of both comics were pretty fantastic. Oh boy, we start with Jeffrey St. John, the only guy to canonically cuck Sonic the Hedgehog. He's on a mission to rescue some royalty of the Acorn family, along with my boys, Heavy and Bomb. The Buffalo Lodge are tracking them, but Locke gets distracted when his ex-wife just shows up in the Forbidden Zone. Also while this is going on, Knuckles finds a woman freezing to death on the street and leaves her to go find her baby. Don't worry about that for now. Locke finds Laura Lay, they talk, and it's heavily implied that they're going to fuck in the space cruiser. Two for two, Ken links the Knuckles storyline to Laura Lay as he goes looking for his mom with Julian Remington, the head cop. No, the fact that his name is Remington and he is a cop is not lost on me. Issue 20. Double down on the fact that Locke and Laura Lay are totally gonna fuck. First with a flashback on how they broke up and cutting on them kissing. Jeffrey St. Cuck finds Elias Acorn, the royal bitch boy living with this old dog couple. Yes, it turns out Sally has a femboy brother that was conveniently hidden away for plot, definitely not so we could make him up later. Nothing important happens with him or Jeffrey in this comic. Knuckles doesn't find his mom in her ship since she left in locks. Meanwhile, all parties get affected by the weather while traveling, and Knuckles' plane gets zapped out of the sky. When he steps out, he who boys, as he's teleported to the Water Buffalo Lodge with all the old heads. Issue 21, Heavy and Bomb fucking die. Meanwhile, Knuckles is in the lodge, and the word count goes up way up. Knuckles gets caught with all the petty secret society bullshit that I've been sparing you of, which leads to exposing the betrayer in the group and fighting for two pages. Oh, Heavy and Bomb didn't actually die. Lara and Locke saved everyone and just brought them all to the secret lodge. I think Ken just wanted everybody in the same place and didn't really care why, so he just said fuck it. Either way, the betrayer escapes and everyone immediately forgets about him. However, we discover the reason why Elias came here. They put the queen in the soda! The fan art has been the only part we really enjoyed every issue while we read this on stream. Really hope some of the kids out there are still out there doing artwork and staying away from fur affinity. Much love. Issue 22, also known as They still don't know what a fucking draw is! Also known as the arc where the art style gets a bit better. Oh, and it's also the... No, genuinely, in a twist of fate, Ken has gone from earlier making the echidnas equivalent to the Jewish people during the Exodus to making them, let's call them naughties. Apparently, the Dark Brotherhood is back and trying to pull political strings, specifically led by this dude, Benedict, who looks ready to Reich and roll. They have secret police who silence anyone that opposed them and are wrestling political control. Can you see the parallels? Can you truly grasp Ken's vision here? Meanwhile, the dingoes are protesting due to civil rights issues, living conditions, something. Turns out the guy with the literal Roman eagle on his arm isn't a bad guy, but the victim of it, wild. I don't need to make a joke about this panel either, you, you can already tell. Also, Mammoth Mogul is trapped in the Master Ring Pop now, and Knuckles starts looking cut, I don't get it at all. We end with an intro to our next villain, the Nazi. You're not a Nazi, you don't deserve to be called that and demonized. Well, I, I, see, I, I see good things about Hitler also. Issue 23. Everyone's watching InfoWars at the same time, which is a bit weird for everyone important to be listening, but whatever. This leads to a rally in the park, while the old heads get swatted. After this, they cut to the dingoes getting kidnapped on the streets to introduce a new Enforcer character, 
Zenin, Xanax, I don't know. Xenophobia also gets Knuckles in the Chaotix, one of the few times Knuckles gets actively worked in a one-on-one. -on -one. With the group's capture and the naughty still trying to buy off the police, the old heads hit the Legion with a counterattack. They get ready to stick Knuckles in the microwave while Remington chases down the naughties. The old heads blow up the Legion base, Benedict gets lost Ark, and no one important was harmed. Words don't describe what this arc was. This is what Ken is pretty much notorious for. I don't think we could top this, so uh, how about a small tone shift? Issue 25 is the gala anniversary issue, whatever that means. We start with Knuckles' dad, Locke, chasing a pack of cigarettes or running away from fatherhood, whichever is funnier to you. Nux catches up with him and they embrace. Also, Julie Sue was with Knuckles, but they fucking abandoned her immediately into the sunset. Oh, I know I've also been avoiding the flashbacks shit, but it's 80% of this issue. They decide to introduce humans into the comics, and god, this is a fucking awful fucking ugh. Also, we see Knuckles in his egg, where he is microwaved like just crack an egg. This explains his literal Knuckles having spikes. He is a radioactive super soldier. Ken, why? We go on to explain that Knuckles is, quote, the savior of echidnas. Ken, please. And Ken casually ends this issue by going, and I shit you not, what now? I guess we should just take a break and some quality time together, son. And they walk off into the sunset again together. Why is it like? Issue 29. <gasps> this one is the who cares of the side series. Primarily focusing on the Acorn family drama and Sally's relationship with Knuckles. Yes, I am aware this plays into information presented in the mainline Sonic comic. However, we read Knuckles without context, trying to take it as its own series. And while some storylines are there, and I feel like understandable is way too nice of a word, but I lack a better one, they usually told a story of its own. This single issue is a couple references to Sonic Comics history on Sally's end and to establish that the shit that has been happening in both comics have somehow made it so they can't be friends? Not to get speculative, but I feel like there could be something here, especially to tie Knuckles in with the main cast, and by that I mean the main cast to Knuckles. But I can tell that Ken got that shot down. Speaking of which, we jumped ahead of something before we talked about this. So Ken wants to get a job writing Archie comics instead of Sonic, so we're proving our writing chops today. The Chaotix are vibing in the mall, Vector flexing about how much gushy he could get if he really wanted, while Julie Sue fails the Bechdel test. Knuckles asks his dad why there's heterosexuality and what it means when his multiple penises get bigger. Vector tries to get some strange, Julie is forced to be feminine, which gets her noticed, and Knuckles is forced to cockblock a new echidna. Middle issue. Knuckles pulls a sitcom moment by hiding in a restaurant on Julie's date. He immediately fucks up and almost gets caught, and sulks alone about being a dumbass. For some reason, he immediately finds the Chaotix in an arcade while Vector talks mad shit. Thus, Knuckles jumps him for talking bad about his girl. I would do anything for my girl. Meanwhile, Julie Sue ends her date well, realizing she just ain't that into him. Knuckles heads to ask his mom about women, but that involves talking to women, so he bails. Good thing, since his mom is getting ready for the loofah. Instead, Nux asks Julie on a date through her door, and she has just... The dumbest look on her face. I can't help but love it. Okay, Arc Ender. Knuckles finally goes to his mom to ask, What if she won't like one of my dicks? After their visit, Laura Lay goes to visit Jewy Lee Sue to warn her about the dicks. Also, the women have very strange figures in this arc. 
I had to look up the demographic to figure out if this was supposed to be horny coded, and yep, Knuckles was apparently more enjoyed by teens and young adults. Knuckles and the homies become cool again, Nux and Julie go on their date, but guess what? It's Knuckles' birthday! Which he forgot! Or he was expecting a gift from Julie in his birthday suit. The issue ends with a kiss, and I cannot ignore these designs. What the fuck is this? These designs are going to carry into the side stories, too. These issues were pretty quick and much easier to, s I'm gonna say, consume. Primarily since there weren't a bunch of dumbass flashbacks in the middle. Instead, there's a story for just Knuckles, and a second story being told in the back half of the issue completely separate. The side stories are a sign that Ken had a page minimum, but didn't know how to spread the date arc further. A Friend in Need is a mighty The Armadillo story to save his boy, Ray the Squirrel, both originally from Sega Sonic the Hedgehog from the arcade. Mighty meets a transitioning Knack the Weasel, good for her, and Fiona Fox. They meet up with Sonic in a flashback? The pages really don't make sense here. And the vault we need to open, which is the main plot of this, is immediately in front of them. They bust open the vault to find Ray the Squirrel, and Robotnik is here. Then Ray gets shot, Sonic gets Mighty out of there, and then Mighty has a temper tantrum, which leads to him somehow saving Ray, and they end up as bros again. What? As for the SBO comic, <laughs> God, the art gets worse. <laughs> <clears throat> I mean, Julie is just with her pony looking for Nut. This is directly after the Mighty storyline since Ray is here, and the boys stay behind to catch up. Julie Sue almost hits a chameleon, and Espio checks on the other chameleons in the area. Liza, the not gay proof for Espio, leads him to a roboticized chameleon. There's a dumb flashback in the bad guy's hideout about his past, Liza gets kidnapped, Espio gets worked. By the way, those last two sentences were one issue alone. And Liza is roboticized. What the fuck is this face? Espio tricks our villain and gets the upper hand immediately, frees the other chameleons, and walks away from an explosion. I have no idea what I've learned from either of these about these side characters. Mighty loves Ray? Ken remembers Sega Sonic the Hedgehog? Espio can't be drawn properly, ever? I kinda wanna know what caused these to be so empty. Like, someone who's putting in his last two weeks- oh, right. The Most Dangerous Game is a 1932 horror film. The movie is an adaptation of the 1924 short story of the same name by Richard Connell. In 1999, Ken Penders said, we could just do this wholesale with Knuckles since, fuck it, Archie said we're closing up the Knuckles series. The movies and the shorts plot concerns a big game hunter who deliberately strands a group of luxury yacht passengers on a remote island where he can hunt them for sport. In Ken's retelling, a human is here to kill Knuckles and a gorilla named Monk. Jesus Christ, I'm so tired. I'm getting ahead of myself. Look, this is the weakest, most nothing storyline of the entire series. I'm not kidding. We start with the hunter proving he is Republican stance without a word, then cut to Monk climbing onto Angel Island in a fundoshi, a diaper, what the fuck is he wearing? We flash back to Knuckles getting bullied by Monk and Monk flashbacking to getting thrown off of Angel Island. They're back to back like they're connected, but they aren't. They throw hands until the hunter shows. Middle issue, the two get kidnapped. Knuckles gets threatened by the hunter, specifically with a picture of Julie to imply that he's been watching Knuckles for a while, or is a big fan of Ken Penders, either or. 
Nux and Monk put on proximity collars, meaning that they have to stick with each other and get hit with some of the best faces I've seen in a while. Like, holy shit, I know I'm focusing more on the art lately, but Lord, it's so damn bad lately. It gets distracting. So this is the final issue. Knuckles finds a sewer. Is really? Is this where we're ending the series? Can you be more subtle? <laughs> it's supposed to be hydrosity and Google's doesn't say that's not a word. So that's how I'm pronouncing that stage. Nux's dad finds out the hunter has hacked his global security system. I've been ignoring him this arc because it's mostly useless till the end. Knuckles and Monk try to set up a trap, fuck it up by taking too long, and Monk says fuck it and goes ape shit. Knuckles uses his microwave powers to blow up the hunter's gun, and Nux's dad just teleports in at the end, essentially to arrest him to be used as a villain for another day. I cannot talk about this final arc as anything positive, since all I remember is this is when we started drinking even more than usual. Just watch the movie that's playing in the background instead. At least there's a better story there that stood the test of time. Penders was definitely trying something. Like he really thought he had a magnum opus going. You take some adult themes, mature references to real life, and other problems, but try to ease kids into them with lovable characters they already know. Kids are going to find out about divorce, drugs, war, other shit, and they learn early nowadays. The problem comes from taking that idea and executing it by making a cartoon B die of an LSD overdose. Quote unquote, dingoes experiencing racism and watching Knuckles' parents have like five domestic disputes or cheating or anything else like that. People were and are still into these comics. Hell, there was fan art featured at the end of each issue. Genuinely, they still get attention and appreciation today, or ridicule, depending on your take. However, to most people outside of the most diehard Sonic fans, this shit's just goofy. As any of our interviewed guests can attest, it's hard to take it serious at all. Because, dude, it's Sonic characters, come on. As anyone on my stream or in that chat can attest, it's equal parts funny and genuine suffering, and you can mourn the loss of our sanity along with us by watching the VODs. What we covered today doesn't do justice. If you're curious, please go read for yourself or watch us die reading it for you. The latter will probably be more enjoyable, honestly. Ken Pender still technically writes to this day, and I do plan on reading the next thing he puts out. Wait, what? Oh no!